Hello world. Hey. Hi. 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 Hello. Hello. Hi. It's like I've forgotten how to say hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Life with Kaka. I'm your host and fellow producer, Carolina Gropa. Guys, it's been a busy, busy time for me. And in keeping with the true spirit of Life with Kaka and talking about the messy parts and the hard parts, it's not easy. It's not easy to work three jobs that overlap and find time in your downtime for your other side passions. Mad props to everybody out there who is putting in the hours, working on their hustle, and still finding the time to work on the other things they're also passionate about because it's not easy. So I see you, I recognize you, and I thank you for your patience with me as I'm also finding uh, my path and a way to keep the show going no matter how crazy things get behind the scenes for me. So let's get into this week's episode. I sat down with Natalie Kasabian, who is a very impressive person. She's the producer of Searching, starring John Cho, a movie that they made for $1 million that went on to make 75 worldwide in the box office. It is not an easy thing to do these days, given how little people go to the theaters. She's a hustler and she's a go-getter. She is the only producer I know who was also getting her MBA while in production. No big deal. So yeah, she defines badass. This week's chat, we dive deep into her getting her start with the Duplass brothers, whom I love, chasing the high of making your own projects, and then the rap blues that every producer and every crew member feels inevitably when a project ends. So without further ado, enough of me, let's dig in, let's hear from Natalie. So you were saying that you've done a podcast before, but not like this. I haven't done one like this with an actual mic. So this feels very (laughs) official. In like someone's couch. (laughs) No, I was literally, I was on set in like the production office and they were recording me through Through my cell phone. So this feels very formal, even though we're on a couch. I feel so important. (laughs) You are. (laughs) You are. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Seriously. Yeah, this is so exciting. We were just talking off mic about how how long it's taken Mm -hmm. to get you on my couch. Yep. Um, And over six months, over six months, which I, I actually find that it tends to happen at the right time. Okay. For some reason. And for me, it makes me even more excited to meet someone and talk to them because Mm -hmm. it's like this hour that we have together is so special and so important because of how much it's taken to get us here. Right. Very similar to like making a movie, (laughs) you know, when you finally get to that build up. (laughs) Yeah. To that first day of production, you're like, wow, the years it's taken us to get to this point. Mm -hmm. It's nice to reflect on that. So yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm grateful for you to be here. So this is awesome. How would you define a producer? Ooh, so it's a very tough one. Yeah. But I think at at the end of the day, when I kind of zoom out and I'm like, what, what do I actually do? Not what are the 15 million things that I'm overseeing or in charge of or checking off a checklist. I really think the producer is the person that's in charge of shepherding the movie from before it's even a movie till the end and really, really taking care of every step of the process because, you know, the director's job is to come in and I think be very specific about the vision and the execution, but you're there sometimes even before there's a director. Um, and your job is to really get it off the ground and see it through to the end. I genuinely think of myself as like a parent to the project. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's a corny, uh, corny analogy, but um, I really feel like I am the one responsible at day's end for every every step of the process for being there and taking care of it. That's a very broad answer. And then we can go more specific, but like from a bird's eye view, that's how I, that's how so I So you would say that every project is like your baby. Oh my God, totally. Your children and you see them grow totally. up. Totally. Yeah. And I have, I have issues when there's like a new baby and, and the last one is like <laughs> out in the world. Like uh, my film searching um, was being released in theaters as I was prepping my movie run, which is what took us like yeah. six months to get here <laughs> and the whole time I was like why well, like I'm I'm in love with searching and we put so many years into it and it's my baby 
And then I had all these like weird feelings about making run. Like I was very excited about it. Yeah. But I was like, will I love it as much as searching? Mm. Only time will tell. Yeah. You know? It's like it's like middle child, <laughs> totally. second child. Like, totally. <laughs> the movie's not done yet. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to love it as much, but hopefully. Yeah. Well, it's a good problem to have. But I, I think it's interesting that you you phrase it that way because I, I, I think if uh if making a movie specifically is like having a child then production is childbirth is yep. like nine months of childbirth no 100%. matter how long it takes yep. and it's a trauma and you get to the other side of it and you're like never doing that again that sucked literally i mean yeah i don't know if you've read um shooting to kill christine yeah. Michon's book but yeah, she yeah. literally says um shooting a movie is like childbirth and if it weren't for the forgetting of the trauma like no one would ever do it again but you totally forget when it's all over and you're like well let's pop out another one yeah but it's painful it is painful (laughs) so talk to me a little bit about your your origins and how you stumbled upon this yeah crazy world of producing my origin story yeah your origin story um so i i was born and raised in la um i'm armenian american parents have nothing to do with the film industry Mm -hmm. and as crazy as it sounds i i was raised in the valley in Sherman Oaks. Hollywood felt very far away, even <laughs> though it's like six miles away. Um, and I think it's more because I didn't know anyone in the industry. My dad's a doctor, my mom's a therapist. So um, very, you know, science brained. And I, at like 10 years old, just had this like inkling that I, I wanted a camera and I wanted to start making things. And um, basically got one for Christmas at 10 years old, started making videos at home. I would like animate my mom's lipsticks. <laughs> like I would give them little voices and make stories. Um, and then cut to high school and I started making like short films and music videos and was just like totally in love with it and knew that's what I wanted to do. Didn't know what I wanted to do specifically yeah. in film because I, I didn't really have um, really a good understanding of like what jobs in entertainment were. Which is crazy considering, like you said, you were it's in weird. the Mecca of it. Yeah, it's weird. Um, I remember funny, funny, quick story. I was at... a. Uh, a Starbucks once like in the valley with my mom I'm like maybe 11 or 12 and I overheard a conversation um from a screenwriter maybe aspiring screenwriter maybe an established screenwriter who knows and he was talking about a script and I was I was like mom, we're we're in the company of like a Hollywood person yeah. <laughs> which is like so funny because that's every yeah that's every Starbucks coffee, yeah, every every Starbucks coffee shop, yeah um but anyways and um I in high school did a media focus program which is like mm. a four-year basically your elective each year was something to do with filmmaking and media that's cool and really that's what cemented it for me and that was the first time I was like oh I can make a career out of this and I can go to film school um and in that class is really where I think my producing was nurtured because on every project, um, whether I was like directing or editing, I was also the producer, not necessarily by choice, but because the professor was like, you're on top of your shit, like you're also going to produce this. And so I became the de facto producer on every single project in, in my four years. And by the time I got to college, when I applied to USC, I was like, you know what, maybe, maybe I shouldn't fight this. And also, everyone wants to be a director. So maybe I should try doing the thing that has more you know demand yeah Yeah. (laughs) um so i went to sc for film school i did critical studies um because i had this vision that one day i'd be in this like fancy boardroom and all these you know executives would be citing these old school movies and like foreign films and because i didn't grow up in like a hollywood family like i wouldn't know what those movies were so clearly i have to study crit studies right yeah yeah that moment has like never happened to this day. And I've been <laughs> but working when for it five does? years. When it does, oh I'm going to be like, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did crit studies um, and and uh, really loved it. Really loved like diving into film, old films and, and film history and all that. Um, and then basically my, my senior year, I was interning at a production company called City Room Creative. Yeah, they did um, Jiro Sushi, them. right? They did Jiro Sushi. I didn't know that. That's so funny. Yeah. I know Brandon and a lot of those oh, guys. No yeah, yeah. Um, and so they they were coming off of Jiro Dreams of Sushi. They were like prepping all these documentaries that they were mm-hmm. going to go into production on. And they needed an office PA. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I'd done development. And I was really like in school trying to just wet my feet into every aspect to figure out. Because I didn't, I knew I wanted to produce, but I really had no idea how to get there. Um, and also had some awareness that there's like 50 different kinds of producers. Yeah. So anyways, I took this internship and was basically assisting the line producer. Um, and it was a really great experience. And basically the day I graduated, he called me, my supervisor, Jeremy, and 
was like, I, uh, I realize you're graduating and that means that we can't employ you anymore for student credit. <laughs> so I guess I'm going to hire you part time. <gasps> you know, can you start Monday? And I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Do you realize I'm graduating today? And it was like the best day ever. Cause yeah. I, I was starting to feel like, what am I going to do? Like, you know, that grace period of I'm looking for a job can only last a couple of months. Um, and so I took that job and, um, really got to learn uh line producing by by just working really closely with the line producer mm. i mean it was on documentary so it's a little bit different obviously yeah. than scripted content but um it was really cool he was so transparent with me he like b- showed me budgets and like showed me how he did it in movie magic he let me look at cost reports like he was just really really transparent and one of those people that i was grateful for at the time but looking back now i'm like oh wow not everyone is like that with information, Mm -hmm. especially with young, you know, young people. So um, that was really where I started to learn kind of the basics of production. And then um, he was going to leave the company and I decided to, to, to apply for a full-time job at another production company called electric city entertainment. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, they were doing documentaries at the time, but also um, narrative features, scripted features. And I was like, Oh, that might be a cool way for me to segue you know, in, into into narrative fiction, which is what I really wanted to do. So I took a job as an office PA again on sports documentary. So my skills kind of aligned very specifically yeah. and um, really just made an effort to like go above and beyond. And within like a month, I was bumped up to APOC. And then a month after that, the production coordinator left. So I got, I got to take yeah. her position. APOC is assistant production coordinator. So it goes typically office PA, APOC, production coordinator. And then depending on how big your team is, you'll have a supervisor above you, sometimes even an assistant supervisor if it's a very large team. And then from the supervisor, if it's a union show, you'd have your UPM slash line producer combo exactly. or just your line producer above your UPM, depending. Just Yep. Yeah. No, thank you. That's helpful. I realize I'm like, giving these acronyms no no worries um and so yeah that, that was really cool for me because i i was like y- you know just getting new challenges thrown at me every day and more responsibility and then um the uh, one of the founders of the company jamie patrickoff um slash producers there was looking for a new assistant this is like three months into me being there and i had kind of like put it out there that i really i wanted to be a producer one day a creative producer like that was my goal and so the the vp of the company katie mcneil um said hey like i think you should apply for this you know we we really like you here this would be like a way for you to you know stay and get outside of production and so um i applied and it was a like, crazy application process i had to like read like six scripts do all this coverage like make itineraries it was like a really grueling application wow. process and of course i had to apply while we were shooting we were doing like a cooking show, like a branded content cooking show at Starbucks. And so I'm like on set working like 16 hour days, like coming home and like trying to do this application packet. Uh, <laughs> it was a crazy time. Um, but then I, I got the job, honestly, to my surprise, because it was all these like CAA assistants coming in. And I, I was very aware and insecure of the fact that I didn't have any of that agency, like formal mm-hmm. mailroom training. Like I had rolled calls literally once at an internship i I still don't know what rolling call means it's really nerve-wracking i mean i get that it's like you call someone calls you and then you put them on hold and then you forward that call well it's like you're you're whoever you're working for if it's an agent or like a producer like hollywood especially like the older generation is still very old school and that they like pick up the phone for every little thing it's probably smart because it saves you time rather than sending an email but everyone's busy and so like half the time they call and like they don't get through. So you have as an assistant a call log and it's like where you track incoming and outcoming calls and who your boss owes um, and, you know, messages and all that. And like some days you're literally just on the phone like all day long. <laughs> um, and it feels really scary, especially the first couple of times you do it. But anyway, so I, I took that job yeah. and I, and I did it for about three months and I was pretty miserable and I think for me, I now look back and I'm like, why was I so miserable? I think because I came from a production background, I mean, a couple of months of it, but a production background um, where I was used to making things all the time and working really long hours and, and craziness. But I felt like my work was going into something where I could like directly see the outcome. Yeah. And to go from that to being an assistant where I had like no experience in, in doing that. It's a very different world development and agencies and, and putting projects together. 
uh, it felt like after three months, I was like, what have I actually, like, I haven't actually like produced anything. Like I can't point to anything that I've like, you know, yeah. contributed to. Which is interesting that the amount of like hoops you had to jump through just to get that job when all you were do- doing, in, at least in the beginning, I'm sure eventually you would have yeah. grown into that was something very it, passive in a way, yeah, right? Yeah, from yeah, your perspective, exactly. like from the perspective of the person doing it. I'm sure it's yes. helpful to the, the bigger. So helpful. And I, and I think that's part of the problem is too, because I was young and I hadn't done it before and I didn't necessarily have an understanding of like how my position as, as an assistant at a small company where you have a producer who's like very active and has a bunch of projects in various stages, I always felt like, oh, but I'm like just an assistant, but yet there's all this responsibility, but I didn't quite understand. I think I was just quite green, honestly, and Mm -hmm. didn't understand it and felt a little bit frustrated um, by some of the work. And so I quit after three months. um, And a lot of people around me, wise people, um, mentors and friends were like, don't quit. Like people wanted that job. And I was like, I can't do it though. Like I, I, I was very unhappy. So what was that time like? I mean, the the three months was honestly pretty dark. Like I was not, I was really unhappy and I can't remember being that unhappy like ever. And I literally was like, <laughs> I was taking his dog home one day and, and I'm like quite afraid of, of dogs. And the dog was like acting up in my car. And I realized cause he had to go to the restroom and like I finally took him out of the car and he did his business. And then I'm like getting ready to leave and I literally looked down and I had stepped in the dog's poop (gasps) and I was like, okay, this is that moment where like the universe is telling me I'm going to quit. That is a wonderful story for it life with Kaka. Moment. It, oh my God. Oh my God. I didn't even realize. That's it. perfect. Literally, I literally stepped in shit and I was like, I need to make a change. Um, oh my God. So I made the decision one night. I go to work the next day and I'm like, this isn't working. I also don't think I was a very good assistant. So I think he was probably quite relieved um, when I said I quit. And he was like, well, but you're really good at the production stuff and we're about to do this documentary. What, like, why don't you, why don't you cover my desk? until we find someone else and also work on the production stuff since you like that so much. And I always thought that was like, so, so, so sweet and like such a generous offer. It was like, well, you know what? That's a good idea. That way I'm not unemployed. Um, So I made that shift and it was quite nice because the, you know, me leaving was like an amicable thing. So I started to do production stuff again. And in the meantime, started networking or not even networking, just reconnecting with people from USC and um, a bunch of people were, you know, fresh out of school and had Mm -hmm. shorts they wanted to make. And so I I just started like hanging out with people that wanted and needed a producer and couldn't really afford to pay one. And I was like, you know what? I'm still kind of working this job. I'm going to be leaving soon so I can start working on your projects. I don't need to get paid. I can afford to do this for free because I'm like saving up this money here. And so it it actually wasn't that scary ultimately Mm -hmm. because I kind of created a smooth transition for myself. But what was scary was how do I go from like making shorts to actually forging that into a career? And I think that was the, mo- there was like a moment there after I made a couple of things where mm-hmm. I was like, okay, what now? And so how did you do that? The timing of it all is kind of a blur, but basically I, I did this short called join the club with a filmmaker that my um, now fiance slash is sometimes Sev? Sev, you know, oh, Sev. yes, I know Sev. sometimes producing partner, yeah. is it sometimes work partner, always, always life, life partner. partner. I read that in one of your interviews. I was like, that's so cute. I love um, it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, he introduced me to, um, this filmmaker, Eva Vives, who, so Sev knew her husband, who's also a filmmaker because they both taught at USC. And anyway, she was looking, she'd written a short film and needed it like a young, you know, hustling producer to, to come in and produce it. It was like a no budget short film, couple mm-hmm. couple grand. And I met her and I really love the short. It was about a, a female novelist who is in a therapy session and she's contending with, do I join this women's writers group that I've been invited to or not? Because she's having all these like feminist feelings but also like anti-feminist thoughts at the same time and it was really funny really relatable um and i love the short and i met with her and we like we clicked right away yeah and i was like i want to jump in i'm literally quitting quitting my job like i have a month left and she was like okay great so she we leave that coffee she calls me like two weeks later i'm literally like on my last week and she's like i want to hire you let's like let's do this let's get started and i was like that sounds great but I'm leaving town because at the same time, Sev had called me from Savannah, Georgia, where he was producing a movie, an indie movie called The Intervention, and was like, his UPM was kind of 
I mean, they were under a lot of pressure, but I think she was like struggling. It was a really small movie and there was like a lot of pressure on everyone. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I need you to fly out like day two of production. Like I really need backup. And I was like, well, the timing kind of works out because I'm leaving this job so I can come do that. There's a paycheck, you know, that'll yeah. turn me over. And so everything kind of like happened at once. I'm like leaving. I, Eva calls me and is like, I want to hire you. And so I was like, I need your help. So basically did what a lot of producers do. I said yes to everything. Because <laughs> I was like, I will figure out a way to make it all happen. So I basically flew out to Savannah, Georgia. I'm like UPMing this movie. It's like a three week shoot. Really, like, and had you UPM'd something like that before? I not officially on paper, um, but actually, my credit came after because he was like, "Just come out." I don't even know specifically mm. what you're gonna do. And then him and and one of the EPs basically like des- decided what credit to give me. But he was just like, "I just need help. I just mm. need someone who knows production, and I can you know th- throw you a couple hundred bucks a week." And I was like great i'm not doing anything else but i was very much doing i was like doing a little bit of everything it was one of those indies where he was a producer but he was getting his hands really dirty on like um on like line producer stuff and so i was basically his right hand Mm. um but yeah so i said yes to everything i go out there i'm like producing join the club at night like i'm setting up interviews (laughs) forever with like dps and and department heads and um basically i i met this woman on that film named Mel Eslin, who yeah, is I know now, Mel. oh, you know, Mel. Yeah. Oh, amazing. I'm trying to get her on this podcast. She's another one that's, oh, taken. she's got so many stories. She's, she's so busy. She's though. amazing, but she's it's so just busy. also extremely busy. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. So I met, that's where I met Mel. And, and she at the time was just signing on to kind of run the Duplass brothers. They'd signed this like five picture deal with Netflix mm-hmm. and the orchard. And she was like, I, I, she basically met me and was like, who are you? And thank you for like, coming and helping and and like you know I, I remember a lot of they really i was really helpful in like lifting the crew morale because everything kind of there there was a lot of shit that hadn't been done yet when i got yeah. there just because it was a small movie and by nature of it and, and she was quite grateful to me and um she was like when you come back to when we get back to la let's sit down and talk i want to hear like what you want to do yeah and so i told her you know i want to be a producer i'm like down to do anything like i'm down to really get my hands dirty um you know and she was like well i have a bunch of movies coming up i'm just gonna like call you when something pans out and cut to like i think a couple months later she called me and was like we have this film called rainbow time that duplass is like coming into and taking over they've already shot some but we're gonna go and like script um like five five days of of additional shoot and come in and basically Mm -hmm execute that shoot she's like it's basically like a short film it's like five days come in plan that like basically line produce that and then maybe you can oversee it in post and you know we'll see what we need from you and basically it just it kept growing it was like okay i'm gonna stay on through post and i'm gonna do all this stuff and she's like you know what i'm gonna give you a co-producer credit and and that's amazing it was huge because i was like that doesn't happen you know usually it's like associate producer um and she was always very generous with um opportunities and credits and all that and that was just basically the start of like two years of working with mel um and mark and jay on uh, on i did three films with them and then worked on some of their they started a branded um like short form company called Mm -hmm. donut Mm -hmm. and i worked with donut for a couple months um and that was really when i look back at it i really think it was like my grad school in filmmaking because i i learned I learned how to produce by yeah. getting thrown into it. Yes. I mean, that's the the most sort of common through line in, in the many interviews I've done so far is that, you know, a lot of the producers I speak to say somebody will come to them, want to be mentored or want to learn. And mm-hmm. it's just one of those jobs, one of those career choices that you can't learn by watching someone. You have to just be thrown into the fire and do it and figure it out and fall on your face and make mistakes. Hopefully they don't cost too much or, or, you know, or or have too much of a side effect on anything. But that's really the only way you learn what producing means and what kind of producer you are going to be in that process. Oh yeah. 100%. I learned so much about myself how i work how much i can take on yeah um somewhere in all this i decided to go back to grad school and (laughs) get an mba um because i think i'm just one of those people that likes to be incredibly busy and i think i work well when i'm yeah more on my plate um and i joke that that's like my insurance policy that like if i ever want (laughs) to switch to the more corporate side of filmmaking but i love it so much but it was really my way of like how you know i I really like the business side of filmmaking maybe i want to segue into that more someday and and also just i love learning and i love being in school so 
that was that was a fun uh sometimes chaotic decision <laughs> so being so busy and juggling so much but how do you find time for self-care and for your relationships and sort of that that yin yang of yeah. life you know ironically what became there was a moment like i think i was shooting uh, a movie called duck butter uh with the duplass brothers mm. don't don't google what that is if you don't know what it is <laughs> I, I was like juggling a lot. We were prepping a movie called uh, Search at the time, which became Searching. And like the two were overlapping and I was like really, really stressed. And I was also trying to make a movie happen called All About Nina that I, that, with the filmmaker that did join the club. Um, and I, I think my moment of like self-care was what is the project that like I really want to put my heart and soul into? And, and you know, I, I want to, I love everything that I did with the Duplass brothers. I truly do. But there was a moment where I was like, oh, I'm I'm like getting these projects because I'm in this world and I'm really lucky and I'm really grateful for that. But I'm now having this itch to like tell the stories that like resonate with me, you mm -hmm. know, more. And and I made a decision to um, you know, really commit myself to all about Nina. I can't remember what phase we were in at this point, but I was like, I'm going to get that movie off the ground because it's something that like, I was there from day one. I was there with the filmmaker when we made the short and a weird way that became my like self-care was like, Oh, like I have to now put energy in the projects that I want to make to start crafting the career that I want, because there's nothing for me that's more fulfilling than watching something that I feel like I poured my heart and soul into and I like yeah. creatively, like I always go back to the first short film I made when I was like the first official short film that I made when I was 14 in high school in my media focus program. Um, it was called angel in disguise, very like silly plot. But I remember we screened it at our like showcase at the end of the year. And I literally was like, Oh, this is the high that I'm going to chase for the rest of my life. Like, yeah. I knew I was like, nothing is going to come like I'm going to be chasing that feeling. And so there was a moment like doing all these like Duplass projects and, and like music videos and like just, you know, getting all these little projects off the ground where I was like, I got to start doing things that like, I really like creatively yeah. to get that feeling again. And in a weird way that became my self care hmm. because I was like, I'm going to do what fulfills me. Um, well, so then how do you manage and get through the times when there's so much work and, stress that goes into what becomes the very short lived moments where you get to feel that high. So how do you manage to stay sane and focused through all of that to get to that, this yeah. sort of like pinnacle yeah. of that feeling? Honestly, I think that because making movies, it, it is a marathon, but then there are portions within it that feel like sprints and that feels like production and prep. And then, when I, when I get to post, I always feel like a big, a big sigh of relief because it feels like there's a couple, you know, there's like a period of time where the director is doing their cut. And I, I mean, on a lot of these films, I've been the post supervisor, so I'm still doing a lot mm -hmm. of stuff, but I can suddenly like, I have my nights back to myself and I can like see my friends again. Yeah. And I think it, I think I've now just learned that like, you're going to be really busy for like months at a time, but that there, there is a relief, like there really is. And yeah, a lot of the times you're then prepping the next thing, but um, I'm now at a place where like, I, I feel really grateful because after searching, um, it just really opened up a lot of doors and, you know, the yeah. movie, we, we made it for less than a million dollars and it went on to gross 75 worldwide. And, and suddenly people were like, what are seven and each writing next? And, yeah. you know, the three of us are a team. And, and so it, I feel really lucky in that I can slow down a little bit now and focus on less projects a year and i think the self-care just happens when you're done shooting and you're just like you know i'm now in i'm in post and and developing and so it's like i'm not i'm not working 16 hours a day i mean i still i'm I'm up early and, and i don't stop working till late at night but like i can be on the couch at night you yeah. know with a glass of wine <laughs> and have big little eyes on in the background so um I think it just becomes a lifestyle that you get used to. I don't know if I'm really answering the question, but no, I mean, I, maybe there isn't an answer. It's more of just like, yeah. it's always changing. It feels like it's a constantly sort of fluid thing. And I, I find that the kinds of people that are attracted to this lifestyle, it's regardless of where you land in that pathway, like there, there is a very interesting personality trait that I have found that is very mm -hmm. common among, yeah. you know? I think and so, so yeah. it's, I think it's people who are not um, 
they they sort of live for those highs and lows and they're yep. not really content in the stasis of life. They like that constant sort of yeah. the up and down. Of totally, it. totally. There yeah. is, I think, the downside of dealing with that. Absolutely. It's, it does burn people out. It does, yeah. You know, and it does become sort of overwhelming i think especially when you freelance which yeah. i know you you I, still I, do freelance. you yeah. still do yeah. yeah so i'm sure you can speak to that just the ups and downs of being so busy for six months that you don't even have time for your friends or anybody mm-hmm. in your life to even buy toilet paper or even record a podcast but then then you have so much free time that you're like oh when is the, next, the next job yeah. and even if you are overseeing other parts of different projects like you said it doesn't require all of you yeah and it's such a distant so that that constant Highs thing lows, yeah. it's it's really challenging i definitely i've been freelancing for a long time ever mm-hmm. since i started in this business i didn't go the agent route i never was an assistant to anybody i yeah. just kind of did my own thing and so i still struggle very much with with that with Mm -hmm. with that that pendulum swing and and finding ways to occupy myself and feel like my productive well productive in that you know my self-worth isn't defined by whether or not i'm working yeah yeah and that's really challenging i mean do you do you struggle with that as well you know i do and i and i found honestly the the first time it happened was was recently i think right after we wrapped run Mm -hmm. because i was i finished grad school right before we left to, to shoot run. And so I was like at the, like the pinnacle of like my craziness. I'm like turning in my thesis project and I'm like getting on a plane to go scout. And it was truly like, like I'm not sleeping around the clock kind of thing. And then, you know, you, I always feel a little bit, I always feel a little bit depressed, honestly, when I wrap a production because, yeah. and it took me a couple times to realize that like why it was happening. Cause you go from being with a little, a little family hopefully like in the in in the best of productions you become a family and you're around people all day long you're like eating your meals with like a hundred (laughs) people every single day and you you just sleep at home you wake up and you're just surrounded by people and you're like stimulated all day long and then you wrap and you're like home and it's really fucking quiet and you're like where is everyone and i always feel a little bit like and I and I'm such a loner and I'm such an introvert that the first time this happened, I was like, "Why do I feel sad? Like I like yeah. being home alone." Um, yeah, <laughs> but I think it's because you go from being around so many people and so stimulated. But yeah, after run, I was like, and I still had. Don't get me wrong. Like I have, I have projects I'm developing. I I'm you know obviously overseeing run, but this was like in the director's cut period, and I was like, oh, I have, I have a lot of time. Hmm. Like, do I do this? Do I do that? Am I, is there something wrong with me? Cause I have, I'm not on set. Like, yeah. why am I not on set? So yeah, I did struggle with that a little bit um, after this movie, but the way I, co- now I'm just like, well, this isn't going to last very long. So I've become like, I'm going to, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to read a script every day. I'm going to make sure I'm like networking and meeting someone. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to, you know, make sure the projects I'm developing stay very much on track because I'm trying to hit benchmarks. And so, so I've, I've, I learned how to like, get myself out of that rut and that's just by being busy even if it's not on one specific job um but yeah it's a real thing and no one talks about no one tells you when you wrap a production you're gonna feel a little bit lonely yeah it's like a postpartum depression honestly to to stay on the childbirth metaphor yeah and uh, no disrespect to women who obviously have suffered from real postpartum depression and i don't have children of my own so i don't i can't speak to any of these things as real uh experiences but you go it is you go from hundreds of people a day especially as a producer not just you know being with them but needing something from you yeah all the time every day to nothing to no emails to no fires and you once you get used to that new form of life you kind of get into that that wavelength and when that ends you're like oh like what is this and on sylvie which is a feature i was on that i just wrapped in may I was talking to one of our lead actors who's also the producer, Namdi, and he was saying that the, the feeling is emptiness yeah. because you've been filled for so, so much, much yeah. with so many people and things, whether it's good or bad or the stresses of it, you're just filled with emotion at all times. It's so true. And things, yeah. you know, and people and all of that. And then you go from that to like your tank just goes all the way to low and you're like, what? And it's so funny because when you're in production, yeah. there's nothing you look forward to more than rap. And I then know. it comes and you're like, oh, I miss, I know. I miss production. That's why I, why I think that we're like weirdos and crazy people yeah. because... We put ourselves through it. We put through ourselves this. through it. And, and the 
production aspect of making something which is very important obviously is a trauma in many ways you know yeah. if even if it's a good if it's a good team of people you're working everybody and yourself to the brink because that's what's required for sure you know yeah. you take so sometimes it's years before you get to that precious part of the 30 days, mm -hmm. 45 days, however much time you have to literally create such the thing you've been cooker. talking. Yeah, yeah, you've been talking about. So everybody's operating on such high. Um, it, so it's really tricky to go from that to the sort of downswing of that. But I, I feel like there should be like a support group. I was just going to say that. For producers <laughs> yeah. or anyone to just or come. Rap, rap support rap group. Support group yeah. You know, to come and commiserate and just. Yeah. Because it is, it takes like, usually for me, it's about two weeks, but similar yeah. to what you said, now at least I know that that's going to happen. So I have ways you're of prepared, dealing yeah. with it. But in the beginning, you're like... But I'm so happy that you're even like talking about because I've, I've literally never heard yeah. a producer say, and, may, and maybe, you know, maybe it's because the the producers who get, um, you know, any kind of like publicity are, are operating at, you know, the top of their game and they're, right. they're probably just so busy, they, they maybe don't have that. But I think in, especially in the independent world and the freelance world, like yeah. it's, a, it's a real thing. Well, and I think that the producers who are sort of more well-known aren't necessarily the producers who are on the ground running production True, day to that. day. They'll yeah. come to visit set for an right. hour and then leave, you yeah. know, and be home for dinner with their children. Yeah, yeah. That, at least that's the impression sometimes one can have. Since They're busy in other ways, yeah. you know, and that's part of which leads perfectly into this next question about what are some of the misconceptions that you think exists about producers? Oh man. Well, I think, I think for people like not even in the industry or even trying to be in the industry, I think there's this perception that the producer is just the money person. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a little upsetting because, um, you, it's so much more than that. Even if that is a part of it, even if you are a producer who attaches financing, um, you know, that also just sounds so simple. It's never that simple, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's probably the biggest one. And then I think the other one is that producers aren't creative, that they're just like a logistics, you know, like a drill sergeant. And that's also not true. Um, you know, not every producer is creative. Obviously there's, um, although no, I take that back because I think even when you're like, I've line produced, um, I've never taken that credit cause I've always done more than that. Um, especially on the Duplass movies, it's mm -hmm. like, you're always doing a lot of everything, but even line producing is creative. Like you're creative problem solving like all, all day long. Yeah. Um, so that, I think those two are the big ones that producing is a pure logistics thing and, or like a financial thing. And I, and I think there's even people in the industry that have that misconception. Yeah. Have you, I mean, Maybe you have or you haven't. It seems like you're, well, you're a very impressive person, by the way. I just want to oh, say that. Hardly. Well, just from like <laughs> reading all the things and yeah. everything you've done and how much you've managed to accomplish and what seems to be a very short amount of time. You're just Thank like you. a hustler and a go-getter. And the fact that you're a woman is even like more extra, extra points just in a my- crazy person. <laughs> just not a crazy person. I think you're just you're hungry, you know? And I love yeah. meeting people who are just hungry for, for- life and pursuing opportunities in their yeah. own career. But in that hunger, have you faced dark times or times where things weren't going your way? And you maybe thought of like, why am I doing this? Why am I in this business? This is crazy. And if so, like, how have you dealt with those lulls in yourself? Yeah. And, and then what made you come back into? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't, like, I've always had this very I've always had this tunnel vision that like, I'm, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to find something. I'm going to make it work. Like the scariest moment was probably when I decided like, okay, I'm going to make this shift from, well, qu quitting electric city was, was scary to a degree because I didn't know where it was going to lead. But more so than that was taking the jump and saying like, okay, I'm going to try to creative produce now and I'm not going to line produce. And I still get, you know, I still get hit up for line producing jobs and I'm, I make a very conscious decision not to take them, even if the projects are something that I really like, because I'm, I'm scared that I will get comfortable doing that because I do really like it. I enjoy that work. Yeah. Um, I love working on, you know, indie films, like a million dollars or under is like the sweet spot. Like it's really, I'm really comfortable there. There's been a, a challenge in saying like, okay, I'm going to be a creative producer. I'm going to turn down those jobs. So there's been moments of like, like being scared financially yeah and like how am I going to make it happen and then the way I've kind of supplemented that is like well 
I could have a side hustle where I make money with my line producer skills and I do budgets, you know, I do, especially if, if someone has a movie like a million or under, um, non-union in LA, like I, I, I know that very well. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think that's the scariest part of it, honestly, is the, the financial of it and, and not knowing, but I am very lucky in that I had like, you know, Sev, my life partner is also in this industry. Mm -hmm. He's been at it longer than me. And so we, we tend to, we tend to lift each other up, you know, when one of us is down. And so I think having someone like that, I have a very, I have a handful of people in the industry that are close friends, not even people that I've worked with, just they get it, they're in it. And, yeah. and we can vent to each other and speak openly. Um, and I think you just have to like, I think you reach a certain point where you're like, it's okay to, to not know. And you start to recognize the feeling of not knowing. And, yeah. and you just, I just have, I guess I have coping, coping mechanisms, but yeah. I think that's been the scariest thing being like, Oh, I'm getting offers to go do a job. And I could be in production right now. I could be shooting in that city, which is like so fun. Cause I've never shot there, but I'm going to say no, like that, that's quite scary. And I, yeah. and I doubt it sometimes. I'm like, why did I do that? Like, I could have been shooting something right now. Yeah. Um, but it's a conscious decision to not not get stuck doing that because it's not my end goal. Yeah. The lifestyle of a creative producer. Um, I mean, it's all rigorous. It's all challenging in its own way. But I think sometimes one can look at that from the outside and think it's so easy mm-hmm. and think it's all just like, oh, you're just putting things together yeah. and you're yeah, just yeah. like, you just make a call. And, yeah, and you're not even making the budget. Yeah. You're just yeah. like, you're not, you know, and, yeah, it, and it is isn't. A, there is a little bit of a, of a stigma with that. Yeah. Of a stigma, yeah. And I, I, I think that it is a really difficult choice to make between will you be the person that line produce and runs production for someone else's mm-hmm. projects mm-hmm. or are you going to be the person that's go down the path of being broke until you get a hit, you know? Right. And it's I think every producer faces that choice at some point, yeah. you know? Um, I think there's a stigma too around... I. I, I had an insecurity when I was first like, oh, I'm hey, I'm a creative producer on this project because I had line produced and and people tend to, which is just like human nature. People see you as what's on your resume, um, which is a natural thing. But I, there was a moment where I, I, I did have like, oh, are people gonna take me seriously as a yeah. creative producer? Um, but I think you just have to own it, and I and I did, and I started owning, it and I was like, yeah, I'm your creative producer. But guess what? I'm I'm gonna interrogate the shit out of the out of the budget because I know how to read one yeah, and I know how to make one and, and I'm going to pick the best line producer to be our partner on this because I, I know what that work entails and I know what it needs. And yeah. so I just turned it, you know, turned it and flipped it, flipped it and, and owned it and made it a positive. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. So with, with having a partner who is also in the business, I mean, has has that been, you said it's, you guys obviously lift each other up and it's been wonderful, but has it also sort of presented unique challenges in your in your life professionally having someone who's also so closely linked to what you do right yeah I mean I think the biggest challenge is that like when when we're on a project together it, you know we're on a project together and as you know like movies take over your whole life and yeah. so um you know it, our our chats at night become about the project and that's honestly it, it's not a bummer because at the end of the day like we're choosing projects we love and um, we really enjoy working together. Like every time, every time we do a movie apart, we're like, Oh, we can't wait to get, we can't wait for the next movie that Mm -hmm. we do with the niche because like, you know, the the trio, we're going to be back together and, and we have such a shorthand and a friendship and like a deep, honestly, a deep love and appreciation for each other. Um, But I think that's the biggest thing. It's just like, okay, relationship on hold project comes first. I mean, like the project is King. Like, you know, when you're shooting something or prepping something, like all all life stops, but the project. But again, it's one of those things that it's like, we know, you know, we know it's coming or um, we just know how to balance. It's like, if we're not shooting, we really, you know, take advantage of that time and, and make sure to spend time together. Yeah. And be yeah. more of a couple than, yeah, exactly. Than producer turn, turn the work off yeah, and, yeah. and, yeah, I love and have that. fun. What do you think creates career longevity in this business? Uh, ooh, I mean... I think that honestly your reputation in this industry is kind of everything because I mean, I can't remember the last time I, I don't think I've submitted for a job mm. since electric city, you yeah. know, since I was like, here's my resume, hire me as an office PA. 
Um, everything is through word of mouth in this industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, more than ever, people are paying attention to uh, and t- are talking about people's character, people's morals, people's ethics are being held to a higher standard, which is a great thing. Yeah. Um, and I and I think that's what's it at the end of the day. Like I I think there's so many talented people um, in the industry in LA everywhere like i think there's so many people that have great stories talented writers talented directors Mm -hmm. producers but i think um having talent is 50 percent of it and having an incredible work ethic is just as just as or if not more important like i might say 60 40 like i truly think your work ethic and your attitude and and just your character is is everything yeah the, the duplass brothers have a no asshole policy and i love that um and I really subscribe to that in everything I do. Yeah, I think that th- your professional identity and your personal identity are not mutually exclusive in Absolutely. this business. And how you show up and how you present yourself on set and in the real world or outside of your sets is should it be should be the same. Mm-hmm. Being a person of integrity, being a person who's going to sort of meet the challenges from a place of like you know sort of peace and calm and. Um, compassion I think is really important because Mm -hmm. the the skill set of producing the part of like budgeting and scheduling and tax credits all of that anybody can learn that that's the easy part honestly in my opinion but how are you going to show up how are you going to confront this issue that can make or break this moment or this part of the experience or this relationship and that only comes from knowing yourself so yeah and that's the only thing you have that's your currency and and your ethic like for me it's i mean maybe because i came from as like such an outsider like i still feel like an outsider sometimes in the industry there's so many people that you know would want to take your place it doesn't matter what the position is so you got to work. You just got to work hard. Yeah. Because if you don't, there's like 15,000 people. Exactly. <laughs> willing to take yeah. place. Well, like work hard, but also be a good person. Yeah. In that. Absolutely. I think there are a lot of people who work hard, but they are miserable humans True. and I True. don't want them around me. Absolutely. You know, it t- takes too much from you and life is too short. Yeah. To be around not just people who are assholes, but just people who are unhappy. It's yeah. like, you know, it takes one, it takes one person with like bad energy to, yeah. to kind of mess it up. So. Well, and especially when you're, it's, if that person is a part of your production team, I think it mis- misrepresents you as a producer. Totally. I talk a lot on this show about how everybody is an extension of the producer to a certain degree right. down to the PA. So to say a PA, is indispensable or not important i think is not true totally not it's an extension of your team so integral it's so integral it's and and it all it takes is having one bad pa for you to realize how integral oh yeah you know that position really is um what do you love most about producing Ooh, i don't think i've ever been asked that you know Mm. um i think my favorite part is when the project is done that sounds so funny that sounds like i'm like a lazy piece of shit but <laughs> now my favorite part is is the feeling you get when you watch the movie with the cast and crew for the first time i guess the feeling of like the the deep feeling of community like that that gratification feeling of like we did this all together um i think i really love that and i and i i, I genuinely enjoy the problem solving like i love being back into a corner and 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 the creativity that comes out of that yeah. like as a team so um, i think because i'm such a deep introvert that i like that in my work i have to work with people mm. and have to collaborate and um and problem solve yeah that's a great answer i like it try i try no, i don't i don't like fluffy answers i hope i'm no i i giving concrete I think so. I hope I hope the listeners are also uh, getting a lot of out of this, which is the goal is to really like I like I was telling you off mic is, you know, there's there's a lot of interviews and there's a lot of things that you can see on social media or mm-hmm. but it's to me it still somehow feels like a facade sometimes right. of the experience, right. not of yourself by any means, but of the experience, of the realities, yeah. of the lifestyle, of what it takes, of the sacrifices that are made. Sure. Like Malcolm Gladwell says in, in Outliers, so just the, the 10,000 hours, and right. you're seeing the 30 minutes of the 10,000 hours totally. on Instagram when you go to a movie premiere. Oh my God, my favorite thing on that note, my, my mom came to visit set of Run, which is the project I'm currently working yeah. on that we made for with Lionsgate. And we shot in Winnipeg, Canada, mm. which is... Uh, 
an interesting place. Um, <laughs> amazing people. Very cold place, though. Um, and my mom came out to visit for Thanksgiving. We were, we were shooting through Thanksgiving. And uh, she'd visited me on set before, but I think it always been a smaller indie project. And so it was like, you know, 30, 40 person crew. And she came out to SETI where we had like, I think 100, 110 people on any given day. And we were shooting in this hospital. And it was like, a it's like part of the climax of the film. And she was just like looking around. She's like, Oh, my God, it like takes so much. And afterwards, she was like, now that I've seen what goes into it, I feel like the fact that we pay $15 to see a movie is such a good deal. And she's yeah. like, there's so much that goes into it. And it was really cute because like the feeling of like the machine. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I've never heard someone like give that opinion. And yeah, and, and and maybe it's because we don't, this is with everything, like you don't see what goes into things. And so, yeah. I, you know, you're just used to, we're just used to like consuming and not just movies, like everything. Everything, yeah. My perspective on one of the biggest misconceptions is that producers have all the answers all the time. And the truth is 50,000 phone calls a day. (laughs) We don't have the answers, but we find the answers. You know, we go until the ends of the earth to find the answer, whatever that answer may be. I mean, even even creatively, I I don't like filmmakers who are so precious about their work that they're not open to feedback. Mm. Like I one of the things that I do and and we do also as a team, Sevenisha and myself, Mm -hmm. um, is get feedback from people at every stage in the process and one of the things that sev started which i now apply on other projects too outside of him is like in the script phase especially for genre movies where you know where you need things to be clear and you need beats to land like i realize you can't do this with every film but we will send the the script out to like five or ten trusted filmmaker friends and ask them over a hundred very specific questions like hey turn to page 12 on this page did this beat land for you did you track this did you understand this Mm. like how did this character arc work for you like macro micro everything in between um and i see that as a large part of my job as a producer to be like yeah yes yes filmmaker like that sounds great i like that that works for me but like let's see if it works for the audience right and um you know so even creatively i think there's a perception that like a director knows best or the writer knows best or the producer knows best. it's like no like it's no. a collaborative art yes. form and it's meant to be enjoyed by hopefully like hordes and hordes of people right i don't subscribe to the idea that like one person knows what's best every step of the way yeah and i think the best filmmakers that i have worked with are the ones that don't that that know what they want very specifically and communicate that um to everyone but at the same time, ask people what they think and are open to suggestions and want to hear crazy ideas because they realize that sometimes there's, it's best idea wins basically. Yes. And I love that. And um, that's one of the reasons I love working with, with Anish and the three of us as a team, we really just, it's like best idea wins. Yeah. Britt Marling, uh, I've listened to an interview with her recently where she talked about that one of her goals with the OA and what she's been doing is to sort of demystify this image that we have of the solo creative genius that yeah. all of this just comes from the brain of one yep. person and it's just like the, the director, the yeah. auteur, where it's really a collaboration. Even at the script phase, it's just yeah. insane the amount of people it that you even don't see. Like aside yeah. from the hundred people on set when you walk up and it's so impressive. Totally. And um it's truly one of the most unique art forms I think that we, we that have. Way, especially yeah. yeah. And the power of storytelling and it's it gets me like very excited, you know, because it's totally. so, so special and I think we're so blessed and so fortunate to do what we get to do. Mm-hmm. And my hope is that people who are listening to this feel inspired by these conversations and have a little bit more so. insight yeah, yeah into what we do and everything that goes into it you see especially when you see a creative producer at monitor just on email and you the crew person can think oh they're just sitting around not right. doing anything and i think that's on the producer too though like because mm-hmm. if you if you've made an effort i think to get to know obviously you can't have a deep intimate relationship with every crew member but yeah. make an effort to to get to know people and say hello and, and then i think they won't have that impression, you know? Yeah. When I was coming up, I had a really cool experience where I got to shadow a producer throughout an entire feature film. I didn't get paid. I didn't have a position. I ended up getting, yeah, I ended up getting like a credit as like an assistant to the producer, but I didn't actually do that. Right. I just basically was this this butterfly on set and I just hung out with all the department heads and I hung out with the grips and I was like, okay, what 
How do you, what is this? Yeah. How do you do this? And what is the thing that you hate most about your producer? Like, what oh, is the, what is the thing that like, is, is the conflict for you? Should like, like a tell all. <laughs> I should, right? But it was just interesting to hear their answers. And, and a lot of it was feeling like their job is misunderstood, feeling like they're not an important part of that process. Yeah. And it's like, at the end of the day, everybody wants, wants to the just, same thing. That's the same yeah. thing, right? It's yeah. so funny. It wants to be heard. And, and I think no one gets into film because their dream is to be an electrician. Right. Right. Like everybody gets into the film business or to, to this business because they love stories. Yeah. And then they, they find make the thing. They want to make the thing and then they find oh I want to make the thing but I don't want to run a department or I don't have the skills to be a technical whatever I like doing this this is where my skill set fits in and it's a needed much needed position and so it's everybody is a part of that machine and everyone is a collaborator in a different way and it it was a really sort of that's really interesting yeah wonderful way to to see that and to realize oh the perception that others have of this person who holds this title that is so coveted it is so silly because we're all there is a hierarchy of course because that's life you right. need that but we're all in the boat together you know and we're all here to to, to make this thing we all yeah. have the same goal and that was a really wonderful lesson to learn when I was very young sort of starting I out oh, I still remember some of those conversations and people were so generous you know with their time yeah. and with the information that they would people share tend to be uh, yeah it's like yeah. people people like sharing so so for for anyone listening who looks at your career that you're building from the outside and says, I think I want that. I want to do that, what Natalie is doing. Mm-hmm. What advice do you have for those people? Um, I would honestly say learn, learn a practical skill because I would never have been given the opportunity to work on searching, for example, which is I think the movie that there's like before searching and after searching mm-hmm. for, for me in my career. And I would have never been asked to work on that movie if I didn't have the skills of a line producer. I very much did those uh, jobs on that movie, but was invited to do more once I mm-hmm. kind of showed creative creative promise and especially in the edit. Um, but I would have never have been given an opportunity to be like, hey, come be a, come be a capital P producer, you know, with with no yes you might have a creative mind but I, I really had nothing to show that you know on paper yeah. and so I, I think my advice for honestly anyone trying to do anything in film is like learn a skill like learn yeah. a, it this is an industry it's a collaboration of people who have crafts different crafts that come together and mine just happened to be understanding how the numbers and the logistics worked and and being the logistic captain um but I think producing is one of those things where no one ever just picks up the phone and hires, you know, a young 20 something as a creative producer. So yeah. if you really do want to like creative produce and put projects together and you have to, you have to offer something is just the yeah. reality. Yeah. So learn, learn something practical and also have a side hustle. Cause, and mine just so happened to be my, my skill, but like there's been times where I was in between projects or, I've worked on movies where I've made very, 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 very little money mm. um, for the time that I committed. And that's just what you have to do to get credit sometimes. But my like being able to budget kind of carried me over because I can make a couple grand doing that. Yeah. You know, and it's like a week's worth of work. Um, so side hustle and come into this with a practical skill. Awesome. I mean, I know you're still at the very infancy of your career, so I'm very excited to see what is all next for oh, you. Thank you. But I got you. Thank you. But what would you say? today and this answer will probably change yeah what do you think and hope will be your career legacy wow um the star wars franchise just kidding um <laughs> the the remake the kathleen reboot. kennedy i'm coming for you no oh. totally kidding <laughs> um you know i don't know in terms of of projects what i would want my legacy to be but i hope I hope when I'm in the grave, hopefully at a very old age, that that people remember me as a compassionate and kind producer and say, wow, we had a really good experience working with her. Yeah. Like despite all the credits, I, I hope I genuinely hope that I'm remembered for giving people a pleasant experience, you know, and yeah. a memorable one. Yeah. I hope that's not mushy. That's not mushy. That's such a great answer. <laughs> I think it's in line with everything we talked about, that being a person of integrity yeah. is 
more important than anything because uh, yeah you can leave behind projects but you can't take those to the grave all, yeah. all you can really take and give is the experience yeah. of yeah. the thing and hopefully when you're leading the troops you can be a, a person of integrity and compassion and, and make it the best version of that process possible so exactly yeah well said well thank you this so much so this is so i'm so happy that this we is like finally... producer therapy is it it's oh really my god nice. like that's in a good way good i'm glad yeah. i've that's... also never told my poop story so i'm glad, I'm glad i have that exclusive now <laughs> thank you so much for listening for tuning in week after week please subscribe rate like review all of the things wherever it is you get your podcast I can't wait to hear what you thought of this week's episode. Natalie has some incredible things to say. So much insight. Working with your fiance. Oh my gosh. Just amazing. Go see Searching if you haven't seen it. It's available on all the streaming platforms. Very cool, unique movie. Uh, And then let me know what you think. So thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next week. Beijos.